All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the University Hospitals Department of Medicine Grand Round Series. Today, we're pleased to have Dr. Alvin Schmeyer speak to us about anticoagulants. Dr. Schmeyer earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia and his medical degree from Virginia Commonwealth University. He then served an internship and residency in internal medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia, followed by a fellowship in hematology and oncology at the University of Pennsylvania, and a research fellowship at the Specialized Center for Thrombosis Research at Temple University School of Medicine. Dr. Schmeyer then became an assistant professor and then professor in the Department of Medicine of Temple University and later joined faculty at the University of Michigan, where he served as director of the coagulation lab laboratory and director of the M2 hematology sequence. He is the founder and CEO of Thromgen in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Schmeyer then joined UH and was the division chief of hematology and oncology from 2005 to 2009. Dr. Schmeyer is author of over 270 publications and eight patents. His research area are long-standing investigations and physiological activities of factor 12 and the plasma calicrane kinin system and how it interacts with the renin angiotensin system. Lastly, Dr. Schmeyer has had a medical practice focused on patients with hemostasis, thrombosis, anticoagulation problems, and unusual non-malignant hematologic diseases that are uncommonly seen. We are very lucky to have him amongst us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alvin Schmeyer. Well, hi, good afternoon. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna start sort of basic, put everybody on the same footing. There's a lot of stuff in anticoagulation management, which is based upon decades of experience and which is in the substratum of how you function today, but, but you were probably never taught it. And then we're gonna move into the newer anticoagulants, and then we're gonna go into the, how should I say, the modern approach to these things, i.e. relate clinical trial data. So these are my disclosures. I think the important one is that um, I was PI of the INDEXA trial here from Portola. We're going to do another one, which we'll talk about later. Um, and um, we were considering, or Portola was considering, but it's been put off now, a, a Batrixaban trial, and that'll come up later. So we're going to talk about the general anticoagulants, heparin and warfarin, uh, historical agents. Uh, we're going to talk about the parental and the oral uh, anti-10As and uh, briefly about the antithrombins and where they fit. So it's important to realize, and we're really talking about the therapy of venous thrombosis. We're not talking about myocardial infarction or stroke, which is arterial thrombosis. So it's important to realize that in venous thrombosis, we have prophylaxis in high-risk high situations. And, and when we anticoagulate, we're preventing recurrence propagation and embolism once a thrombus is present. And let nature heal the thrombus. And we have antifibrin agents, which are all we've related already. And uh, aspirin has a role, although already it's become historic, and I'll, uh, um, and I'll relate that. And lytic therapy, which I'm not going to talk about. Now, lytic therapy has a role in acute massive PE where somebody is hemodynamically unstable. And I'm hoping that each of you have had some experience with that in the course in your MICU or in the CCU in, 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 your, in your training. Um, the data goes back and forth, back and forth of its role in, in, um, in large iliofemoral thrombosis. And the most recent prospective randomized trial data with catheter-directed thrombosis, excuse me, catheter-directed lytic therapy in the clot is, is, and prospectively looked at, is no different than patients just treated with medical therapy. On the other hand, clinically, those of us uh, experienced people have seen patients with very painful iliofemoral thrombosis with relief of the pain and the discomfort with lytic therapy. So it's, it's really not a given and a must, but it has a role, albeit always 
limited. Now, when evaluating an anticoagulant, actually when evaluating any drug, um, 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 it's, it's, it behooves you to know, one, the mechanism of action. Is it a competitive or non-competitive enzyme inhibitor, receptor antagonist, or, or cofactor for a natural inhibitor? It's essential to know the pharmacokinetics, PK, and the pharmacodynamics, the duration of the effect. For example, Vorapaxor has a relatively short PK, but the duration is a couple of weeks. So the anticoagulant effect. It's essential to know uh, whether it's metabolized in the liver or if it's metabolized, eliminated in the kidney. If you know those points about any drug you use, you will be able to predict the complications. Um, and, 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 and the problems you're going to have with it. And it's really the essential information that, that, that one needs to know when dealing with anticoagulants as well as any other medicine. So this is a cartoon I created 20 years ago for, um, for a review article I wrote for transfusion, and it was put on the cover. And I've used this as a teaching phenomena because every year, notice the date, every year I have to change it. Drugs come on, drugs come off, new ones are added, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not going to talk about the antiplatelet agents, okay? The pharmacology and use of antiplatelet agents. Um, there's lots of clinical trial data to show you that. We're going to talk about this limb of the curve, the generation of thrombin or the inhibition of the generation of thrombin with either anti-10As or <clears throat> direct antithrombin. Now, I have to tell you that there's a lot of work um, going on in, in pharmaceutical companies and in good uh, um, investigators' laboratories looking for anti-contact activating factors or anti-factor 9A, which may have role for prevention of catheter-related thrombosis or venous thrombosis, but that stuff as of yet has not... Has, the first generation is getting to phase one clinical trials in humans. So stay tuned. You'll hear about that, anticoagulants or antithrombotics that don't cause bleeding. Hopefully I'll be around to present that to you. Now heparin. So heparin has been around since eons. Irv Wright in 1938 gave himself heparin to treat a DVT. He was a famous um, Cornell physician. And, uh, and has been part of our therapeutic armamentarium for a long time. This old slide from one of our venerable textbooks of hemostasis thrombosis, my mouse is dying, um, <clears throat> is um, 1982, whoops, um, shows you where heparin works. Heparin as an anticoagulant works because it potentiates a serpene, antithrombin, to inhibit each of the enzymes of the hemostatic system. Um, and, and that's how it works. In and of itself, it has no activity. It needs antithrombin. Hence, in liver disease, hence, in nephrotic syndrome, when you have low antithrombin, you have heparin resistance. You need to use more or find an alternative anticoagulant. Now, it's mainly focused on factors 10 and 2 because those are the kinetically fast platforms, their formation of 10A and 2A, for physiologic hemostasis. So hopefully you have in your education something about 10As and prothrombinase, the assembly of proteins that lead to thrombin formation. The heparin and the heparin antithrombin works at 10A and, and thrombin inhibition, and those are the kinetically important platforms for all causes, mainly tissue factor induced hemostatic reaction. Now, heparin is a large natural um, molecular mass protein that functions as an anticoagulant by making a trimolecular complex with the antithrombin, has one region, on, on, on heparin that binds antithrombin, and another region that binds thrombin. And when it sort of puts its arm around it, it sort of moves, hence so that the reactive region of antithrombin can inhibit the active site of thrombin. Um, 
what was discovered about 40 years ago was that in order to inhibit 10A, you didn't need to make a trimolecular complex. You could just have the heparin binding to antithrombin, and that was enough to jiggle the reactive region on antithrombin to inhibit 10A. That's the invention of low molecular weight heparin. So it's a purification of a natural substance. Now, fast forward to the 1980s, um, a group in, um, in France, Sanofi, uh, found that all you will only need five saccharide units. That's fond of Paranox, which is available here, semiparin, which is not available in the United States. Um, and basically, that's sufficient. Now, what's, what's attractive about that compound is that it's synthesized. It meets the metrics of the first world. It has reproducible lots and is not dependent upon massive pig farms, mostly in southeast China, uh, owned by enterprising businessmen to create the world supply of heparin. Some of you may recall that about a decade ago, the world supply of heparin was contaminated with a similar kind of substance called chondroitin sulfate. And it wasn't discovered until there were 166 deaths and countless um, um, allergic reactions to that heparin worldwide. We had several here at UH Hospital, because I've subsequently met these patients um, in, 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 in my practice. So heparin, and you now order, the nurses do this, so you don't think it's important. Um, there's a standard way to give heparin, and this was developed by actually the Johns Hopkins house staff in the late 1980s, early 1990s, where you give a bolus to saturate all the binding sites in the intravascular compartment, and then a constant infusion of 18 to 20 units per kg um, to, to develop anticoagulation. And what was discovered is that when you do this, you are able to anticoagulate within six hours of the time that the patient comes. But if you use a fixed dose, it takes upwards to 32 hours. Data showed back in the 80s that the rate in which you anticoagulated somebody um, decreased the likelihood of recurrence and propagation of the clot. Hence, it, was, it behooved us to do this quickly and, and, and properly. Heparin can also be given subcutaneously. But I have to tell you, there's other uses of harp, uh, heparin. For example, in acute coronary syndromes, in the cath lab, there's a lowering of the dose to 10, 10 units per kg per hour, and I don't know if, if they give the bolus. And then in the management of DIC, we use lower doses, five uh, to, to uh, four to five units per kg constant infusion without a bolus, which is helpful in a small percentage of patients with acrocyanosis and digital ischemia. Now, fortunately, in our hospital, we measure heparin with the anti-10A assay. And the reason for that is shown on this slide. The APTT, which um, saved us when we were house officers from the Lee White clotting time, there must be four people in the room who remembers what a Lee White clotting time was, um, was a great um, um, agent, to, an assay to be available in the early 1970s. But in actual fact, it's about half 50%, actually the R value is less than 0.5, uh, reliable with actual heparin levels. For example, in a group of patients who may have low APTTs here, you would say you would give more heparin, which increased the bleeding risk, but clearly they're in the sweet spot of, of an anti-10A level. And this patient here, which has a very long APTT, you would say it's too high, you'd lower the dose, but you may shift the curve over here, even though they're in the sweet spot. So it's good that we have the anti 10 a to monitor the heparin level. The assay only tells you drug level. It does not tell you efficacy, no assay does, of the antithrombotic potential of, or activity of the agent. So this shows that low molecular weight, can, uh, low molecular weight heparin is smaller than, than, than unfractionated heparin. And this is the cartoon that describes uh, Fonda paradox. <clears throat> Now, this is the important take-home message to put everybody on the same page. Um, mechanism of action, I've mentioned already, potentiation antithrombin inhibition. The pharmacokinetics, unfractionated heparin has a T1 half alpha of about 
two to six hours by IV dosing. Uh, you can give subcutaneous dosing, but it turns out it's, we used to do that when the price of unfractionated heparin was less and the formulation was in high concentration. Now the formulation is mostly 10,000 units per ml, and in some of our, many of our larger patients, it would be a massive amount of heparin. It's almost impossible uh, to give that. Low molecular weight heparin has a T1-half alpha about four to five hours. Um, important, we know that you have to withhold it for 24 hours before doing any kind of invasive procedure, such as an epidural block for somebody who goes into labor. And Fonda Paranox has a T1-half alpha of 18 hours, wait at least 48 hours, 36 to 48 hours before a procedure. Unfractionated heparin is metabolized in the liver, and low molecular weight heparin and Fonda are renally excreted. Now, what do you do with bleeding? Well, with unfractionated heparin, usually by the time you make the diagnosis, you know, you repeated the hemoglobin, it, and you stop the heparin, it's more than four hours, uh, six hours, um, so that usually is sufficient. But in the cath lab, or in, a, in the very rare patient that's gotten a big bolus of heparin and then it has a catastrophic bleed, it can be neutralized with protamine sulfate by a knowledgeable person. And the only knowledgeable person is actually the anesthesiologist or the pump technicians who do cardiopulmonary bypass, nobody else. Protamine sulfate itself can function as an anticoagulant. Now, low molecular weight heparin has a half-life of four to five hours, so it's a little bit longer. Just withholding the drug is usually sufficient. Protamine sulfate is not effective. As we will, as I will, I'll mention this now, but we'll come back to it. The anti-10A uh, antidote and DEXA will neutralize low molecular weight heparin. It's not on the label, but it will neutralize it in a critical situation. And, and we had a case here uh, not too long ago of a patient who had an ICH uh, and was just gotten low, uh, low molecular weight heparin, and we were able to. Well, we, we neutralized it by the anti-10A assay and apparently stabilized the bleed into his head with, with the off-label use. Fonda Paranox is, um, uh, is also an anti-10A inhibitor, long half-life. Um, 7A has been recommended. PCCs have been recommended. They're not FDA-approved. It should work, and DEXA should work, but it's not an FDA-approved agent. We've had one case of a patient who received Fonda, came from the VA, and then start, and had a major bleed, actually needed acute surgery, and we used the Andexa off-label. Am I upsetting somebody of all these off-label use of drugs? And yeah, we were recorded. Now, <clears throat> this is a major point I want to get across at this presentation, and something to be studied within the department. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a scourge. And there isn't a, a two-week period that I go on consults that I don't, we get called from many, but we make a diagnosis of at least one or two patients. The morbidity to the patient, rare mortality, but the morbidity to the patient and the cost of complications is just horrendous. We have the means to eliminate heparin-induced thrombocytopenia in our hospital. And so let me present some data prior to the era of DOAX. So this is at uh, Sunnyvale uh, Health Science Center in, uh, in U of Toronto, excellent group of hemostatic people. And uh, here we go. And basically they had an eliminate heparin program. This started, notice, in 2003 to 2005, excuse me, 2007. And notice what they tried to do is, is suspected hit. Um, um, basically, um, they decreased heparin use by 42%, positive hit assay by 63%, 79%. And then over time, <clears throat> going to um, from 2003 to 2012, the paper was published in 2016, they essentially were able to eliminate, um, hit two patients per 10,000 admissions. <clears throat> so it's feasible to do this. And this is before the era of DOACs. I think we as a department 
harder in the entire hospital if you come to the anticoagulation group meetings, should consider having a committee to figure out how to eliminate HIT with the <coughs> array of anticoagulants we have in this institution. And I'll come back to this. There are data to show, you know, HIT occurs in 1% to 2% of unfractionated heparin, 0.5 to 1% of patients who get low molecular weight heparin. In the, um, by their HIT avoidance program, they had a cost savings of a little under $300,000 a year prior pre-DOAC. And um, actually, some, data, some institutions have shown that if you manage HIT with Fonda, in their institution, it was a six less expensive than Argatraban and a 25% uh, less expensive than Bivail. Warfarin the bane of every medical physician. Looks like the vitamin K um, nucleus it was discovered in spoiled sweet clover and gave, gives hemorrhagic disease in cows. And for any, all the badgers in the audience, um, basically it supported research at the University of Wisconsin for many years. Um, warfarin works as an anticoagulant by inhibiting this enzyme, vitamin K, oxide reductase. And this is important biochemistry. And this is a, this is a, this takes a, makes reduced vitamin K that with um, carbon dioxide and oxygen carboxylates glutamic acids on the amino terminal of a group of proteins, the so-called vitamin K dependent proteins, two, seven, nine, and 10. And these are the enzymes that are essential to form the kinetically fast hemostatic reactions in vivo, tenase and prothrombinase. It, the warfarin effect, the, 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 uh, the prevention of the decarboxylation, or the carboxylation of the glutamic acid, makes these proteins, the one that have been inhibited, inhibitors that function in every other way except blocking the, except forming the assembly to form 10A, hence functions as an anticoagulant. So the effect of warfarin is based on the time it takes to inhibit all these proteins, which has to do with production and clearance, and the time to eliminate warfarin is based on the rate in which you can eliminate the abnormal molecules <clears throat> and uh, correct it with normal molecules. Um, so the elimination is the liver, and requires new synthesis of, synthesis of new proteins to get rid of the carboxylation defect. And um, hence, it takes a long time to get rid of this drug. Factor seven is, is carboxylated in two, half-life is three to five hours, and, and factor nine is 18 to 24 hours. But inhibition of seven and nine is inadequate to prevent tissue factor-induced thrombosis. So clinically, it's not strong enough. You need to inhibit 10, which is up to 60 hours, or prothrombin, which is up to 100 or even 120 hours in order to get proper anticoagulation. Hence, that's why it takes so long to anticoagulate. Now, I consider warfarin today a second-line anticoagulant. Should never be your first choice unless um, the patient has <clears throat> mechanical heart valves, High, mid to high titer antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and perhaps some of the hereditary thrombophilias. Those are still a minority of our patients who have venous thrombosis. And the reason for that, the cost of management and, and, and the high risk of complications really makes this, I think, more of an historic agent for our population of patients in general. Now, practical warfarin administration. Well, it's lower, 10 milligrams for three days, five milligrams for three days. Measure the first INR day five. Um, close follow-up, three times the first week, twice the second week, weekly for four weeks. It, it, it requires a lot of attention to detail, a lot of professionals' attention to detail. Most doctors don't want to spend their time. It's not cost-effective. We have anticoagulation services who spend full time doing this. It's quite a group of individuals that do this, and it's quite an institutional expense. 
but they provide better care than each of us in our own offices and decrease the complication risk. Hence, as long as we have the drug, we should support them. Now, we monitor it by something called the INR, which is an artificial value. And the reason this was created in the early 1980s was so that um, when my patient goes to Stockholm, um, I can monitor her warfarin. In those days, they used to, it was even pre-fax, they sent a telegram. Um, occasionally got a call. Now, of course, you call everybody in the world on your cell phone. It's no big deal. Uh, or get an email or a, or a doc halo or a, text, or, 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 or a text message. But in any event, the way it is, it's the patient's prothrombin time over the mean of the normal PT in the specific laboratory uh, where it's handled. There used to be a fudge factor because of the nature of the thromboplast and the tissue factor that was used that each manufacturer had to create this value. But in the era of recombinant tissue factor, this value is one, hence it's just the PT to mean of the normal labs ratio. Now, the use of the term, the I, a patient has a long APTT and a long INR, um, is clinical parlance. We all commit that uh, mistake. But it really is only designed to describe patients on warfarin. Uh, patients who have a long PT for other reasons, the INR is not the proper language. Hence, it's a, it's a, it's, when I listen to this, it's a degree of, I learn a lot about your medical knowledge for sophistication. Now, why do we do two to three? This was worked out empirically. This uh, slide was taken from a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1982, okay? And uh, there's no other data, okay? So if you add bleeding risk and thromboembolism, the sum of the percentage of a large population of patients, at low doses of warfarin, low INRs, bleeding is low, but thromboembolism is high, so the sum of the risk is 18.7%. And at um, high doses of warfarin, uh, your bleeding risk is high, your thromboembolism is low, you also have a, a, a low value. But at between an INR of um, <clears throat> 2.1 to 2.7 is the sweet spot. Lowest bleeding risk, although it increases as you increase the INR, um, uh, reducing um, um, thromboembolism risk, hence the sum of the risk factors all events added up, which is a phenomenon we use to, in clinical trials today, shows this is the sweet spot for anticoagulation. Now, warfarin skin necrosis, pretty gross. Uh, this is, we see this in, hep this is end arterial ischemia. We see this in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. We see this in congenital protein C deficiency. We see this in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, this is just end, end digital ischemia, uh, arterial thrombosis, and tissue necrosis. Now, this is an entity which is becoming more historic because of the reduced use of warfarin and the availability of oral anticoagulants. And it was a phenomenon that arose in the 60s and 70s and 80s when physicians um, had a patient who had a previous thrombosis, they stopped the anticoagulation, and then they come in with a new clot. And back in the 70s and early 80s, we hospitalized these patients for an inordinate period of time. Two, three weeks was not uncommon. It was really the standard of practice. So the physician wanted to help the patient by saying, well, you have a clot, you need to be put on warfarin, there's no need for you to be hospitalized, we'll just start you on the warfarin. Well, you know, as you know, about 4% of the patient's populations who have thrombosis are protein C or protein, uh, are protein C deficient. And protein C has a half-life of four to six hours. The only vitamin K-dependent protein that's anticoagulant weekly is factor seven, which is three to five hours. So if you were already lowered in protein C, 60%, and you've been put on warfarin within 24 hours, you're going to drop your 7, you're going to drop your protein C, but you didn't anticoagulate 10 and, and, uh, um, or, or prothrombin factor 2. Hence, you produce a hypercoagulable state. Hence, you produce a prothrombotic state, which we saw on the previous picture. And that's essentially 
what these data show. Um, it shows the half-lives of the proteins, protein C. Activated protein C is an it's a vitamin K-dependent protein that serves as an inhibitor by degrading cofactors, 8A, which is a cofactor for 10As, and 5A, which is a cofactor for prothrombinase. Hence, in its deficiency, you have a hyperthrombin-generating hyperprothrombotic coagulation state. And uh, you see this homozygous protein C deficiency, heterozygous protein C deficiency, acquired protein C deficiencies such as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and DIC from sepsis or malignancy. <clears throat> so those are the situations where you have to guard against this and cover your bases by using a global parenteral anticoagulant before you consider the introduction of warfarin, although I suggest you don't and think of an alternative going forward. Now, <clears throat> how do you collect the INR, correct the INR? How do you correct the bleeding? Well, we actually have now good evidence-based data. And I'm going to relate a study that we did 20 years ago this was done by an enterprising neurosurgeon called Nick Bullis, who's now attending at Emory. And Nick wanted to shorten the time that he could take his ICH patients on warfarin. We were seeing two or, th two or three a month at Michigan at the time. Shorten the time he could take them to the operating room to evacuate the clot, thinking that that would lead to a better outcome. So he did an historic uh, analysis controls, and he found out that on the neurosurgery service, as well as everywhere else in the hospital, that if they wanted to correct an INR by giving FFP, it took 25 hours. He then created a protocol by using a, a, a generation of prothrombin concentrate that we had in those days, called conine, and found that his correction time was under three hours if you got conine, whereas if you gave FFP in a protocol prospectively, you could get it to eight hours. So you're actually having attention to detail. Um, and once they stopped the protocol, notice things slipped back. Now, these data showing the efficacy of PCC for ICH bleeding shortened the time to correct the INR, did not show improvement of survival. The data are identical to the four continent. CLS bearing prospective clinical trial that must have cost a half a billion dollars for them to get FDA approval for K-Centra, which you all love and use in our hospital. And, um, but uh, it's one of many trials that sort of address this. Um, again, the, if in this forest plot, if you look at all the studies, uh, here's the Bullis study, and then there's been a whole other of, of similar studies, the the use of PCCs versus FFP to correct the INR strongly favors uh, the PCCs. And if you use PCCs versus no treatment, it, it strongly favors the PCC. There's only one study that suggests that there was improvement of survival, although meta-analysis also suggests that there's improvement of survival of the patients who have serious bleeds, ICH, intracerebral hemorrhage bleeds on warfarin, that a PCC is, is clinically effective. But no, but other than that one single institution trial, there's no, there's no other uh, data for that. <clears throat> so, bleeding on warfarin. Um, you know, if the INR um, is, is 4 to 10 and there's no bleeding, you don't have to do anything, you just hold the drug. If you have a patient with mechanical valve, you don't want to correct them to normal, and then you've got to re-anticoagulate them. You just want to sort of ease back. Um, if you it's greater than 10 and you're freaking, you could give oral vitamin K uh, and monitor the patient. People have given IV vitamin K. There's a, um, acute uh, allergic reactions in a small but real percentage of those patients who we should avoid it if we can. Um, <clears throat> The vitamin K uh, administration in general shortens the time to correction um, for about one to two days. And then this is package insert, how to dose K-Centra um, if you, um, uh, based on your INR for ICH. I might add that if you need to correct somebody with 
uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with K-Centra, um, as pointed out by my good pharmacy colleagues. K-Centra actually has a little heparin in it, so it would be the wrong PCC concentrate uh, to use. There's another one called profilin that you have to add factor seven. Okay, let's move on. I'm getting a little slow. This is a structure of thrombin. It has an active site. This is where antithrombin anti binds and then other anticoagulants bind to this exocyte one. Uh, we have several uh, direct thrombin inhibitors, um, Argatraban, um, Angiomax, or Bivalorudin. These are active site inhibitors, and their indication is to um, <clears throat> treat heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. They're great drugs. They're expensive. Hence, we don't use them in general for parenteral agents, but they're so much better than heparin. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it may need to, should be considered. But generally, they have very short half-lives. You turn them on, you turn them off, and they go away. And so the patients, if there's bleeding, they need support. Now the DOAX, which we'll spend the rest of this time on. So we have uh, four um, 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 10A inhibitors, and we have one um, um, to um, thrombin, dabigatrin. Um, this is the pharmacology. Um, they all have, they have a slightly different half-life. Dabigatrin has a longer half-life. Um, Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, Edoxaban are similar. But Trixaban, uh, which is a new kid on the block, is longer. Um, Dabigatrin has a very high renal excretion, so that makes, potentially makes it a problem. Uh, Riva, Apixaban, and Edoxaban are relatively low. But Trixaban has none. Um, they're all influenced, with the exception of adoxaban, to, to a lesser degree, it's not zero, by these, um, these enzymes in the liver, which oftentimes are influenced by antibiotics that patients are on. Now, the first data that comes out was in blood, 20, a mere 27,000 patients in meta-analysis, use of uh, DOAX and VTE. The forest plot shows these are apixaban and rivaroxaban trials, strongly favors um, the DOAX for <clears throat> um, reduction of, 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 of VTE versus warfarin. Uh, bleeding problems, a mere 27,000 patients, um, same, uh, both uh, apixaban and rivaroxaban, and, and recurrent VTE, major bleeding, intracranial bleeding, fatal bleeding, GI bleeding, uh, all bleeding, neck clinical benefits, Everything favors the anti-10A inhibitor. Oh. This is enormous. This is like cardiology trials. Enormous numbers of patients, not like medical oncology trials of 120 patients or 50 patients in each group. So the data are incontrovertible. <clears throat> um, antidotes to bleeding. So dabigatran does present some problems. Not too many physicians are still using it. Renal clearance. It's a very tight binding thrombin inhibitor. Thrombin inhibitors are rough to work with, difficult to eliminate, and can cause bleeding. But uh, the company came out with a terrific antibody um, that the biochemistry and the clinical data published here that binds to the active site and it, boom, it neutralizes the antibody. Uh, Portola developed um, a, an agent that is an anti-10A agent, and Dexanet alpha and DEX is a trade name. And basically, it's an altered factor 10A, so the 10A binds the anti-10A agent, not only rivaroxaban, apixaban, which is approved for, uh, edoxaban, batrixaban, which is not approved for, but also enoxaparin, any other low molecular weight heparin, and fondaparinox, which it's not approved for. Um, the affinities are different, and so let me show you the kinetics. So in pradaxabind, um, this is the dose response curve for the phase one usage. The highest dose is what is recommended, is you give the drug and wonk, the, it, you're flat and it stays flat. There's such excess of antibody that it sops up all the drugs. So it's a very good antidote. But it costs money to put that in your hospital formula, a, a pharmacy, and not everybody does it. I don't know who else in UH has that drug in their, in, 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 in their pharmacy, and we're not using it much, and it costs money to shelve it. 
and, and debit grandstand is a little harder to use. In Dexanet Alpha and Dexa, you give a bolus. This is from the, from the clinical trial, and I'll explain that in a moment, which brings it down, and then you do a constant infusion for three hours, which keeps it down. But as soon as you let it, you stop the constant infusion, the values rise. Now, this follows with a normal half-life over time. Now, this drug was approved by the FDA, and this is the approval. It's for rivaroxaban use, serious bleeding, and for apixaban use. But it was on the data based on the safety and, um, and the correction of abnormal coagulation times in normal volunteers. The FDA did not approve the drug until 343 patients that were not randomized but looked at prospectively were studied. We did nine here, and, um, and they went through the safety data carefully. We, we had two that raised some flags at the FDA, and they came by and very carefully went through the clinical histories. So they, the, the patient data, which hasn't been published yet, but they, the FDA needed to see almost all of it before they would approve it as a correction. They have also mandated that Portola does another trial. This is a trial that we'll be doing, which is prospective and randomized between Andexa versus TCC for intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, it's a big risk, um, important, because we don't have efficacy data. We only have... We don't have the data from the patient trial safety data. It was well, very well tolerated, um, um, but and hence to find its place. Now, why are we doing this? Well, if you took a big dose of rivaroxaban within eight hours, a single intravenous effusion is fifty thousand dollars. So, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Barsola, uh, Barsola is sitting back there, and he says, oh, "That's a lot of money. You know, I don't want these guys to run home and start ordering this stuff." And if it's uh, eight hours or a pixaban, it's 25000 So I know in medical oncology, that's, not, that's chump change. Um, but in the practice of medicine, um, um, with these anticoagulants, it's a lot of dollars. Now, PCCs. PCCs correct the, uh, the PT and the APTT uh, the, uh, on the anti-10As, not on, on, on um, thrombin inhibitors. Um, there's no data to show safety or efficacy. There was a, pub, a paper published in the JTH in March suggested that it may have helped 63% of the patients and had no effect on 27% of the patients. So we don't know. It's not really a choice. It's a total off-label use for, the, for these drugs. Now, what's the role of aspirin in venous thrombosis? Well, this became popular um, about 10 years ago where it was shown in prospective randomized trials that the use of aspirin led to anywhere from a 20% to 40% reduction in recurrent VTE within 12 months. And, um, and uh, this uh, forest plot suggests overall benefits favors aspirin versus favors uh, uh, placebo. <clears throat> However, it's a changing dynamic. And data with the anti-10As, the rivaroxaban, suggests that um, if you give aspirin, and these are patients who had DVT, and whether you treated them for three months, six months, or 12 months, and then you decide to put them, um, um, decide to st stop anticoagulant, that's what we did with warfarin, um, or, or um, what are the data? So the data are if you treat for three, six, or 12 months and stop an anticoagulant for DVT, you have a 10% likelihood of recurrence year one, 10% likelihood of recurrence year two, 3% year three to year 10, 30% likely recurrence in 10 years. Now that was tolerable in the era of warfarin because warfarin is so difficult to use and to manage. In the era of the DOAX, that's not tolerable and hence new data are developing. So what this trial showed, which was from last year, showed aspirin in this group, once you've treated with anticoagulants and stopped, actually reduced the incidence of, uh, of uh, VTE, um, um, was a reduced, uh, uh, was a 4% recurrence. But if you put them on rivaroxaban, maintained them at the same dose, 
or even at the half dose, the so-called profi dose, the, the risk of recurrence after 12 months um, is around one to one and a half, a little under 2%. So what would you do if you had, if you're male over 60, still a high, slightly high D dimer and had your first clot? Would you stop and risk a 10% recurrence, or would you continue on rivaroxaban or apixaban and have an under 2%, 1.5% recurrence? So I always present it that way to those patients, and they always choose to stay on the drug. Now, if you compare the higher dose versus the lower dose of rivaroxaban, the forest plot shows that in terms of, um, um, of, of bleeding, um, the, um, obviously the you're more bleeding with a higher dose. But if you compare the lower dose with no anticoagulation, um, you know, it's, the, it's clearly ben beneficial. <clears throat> okay. Now, what about DOAX and medical prophylaxis? And this has become very controversial. Um, so there are five large randomized trials with extended VTE prophylaxis in acute medical patients. These are all the eponyms. Only one, bitrixaban, has been approved for the FDA for extended prophylaxis in medical patients. This is a citation. Now, this, the study is a little obtuse, but these are the data. Um, it's, a, it's a favorable, uh, it's in the APEX trial, and it was a comparison of 35 to 42-day bitrixaban, uh, I spelled that wrong, I'm sorry, versus anoxaparin, uh, six to 14 days um, um, in the hospital. They did two cohorts, one with two elevated D-dimers, your medical patients, and one with the same but greater than 75. So the primary efficacy prevention of VTE was significant in, in uh, not quite, was not quite significant in cohort one, but was significant in cohort two. But if you combined all the data, it's very significant. This turns out to be one patient, one or two patients that made it, quote unquote, the p-value not significant. The bleeding risk, however, overall was, was no different. That's the best data that one has for use of an oral agent in medical patients. Now the next slide is, this is an industry slide, so cast aspersions, but it was, it was allegedly done, prepared by uh, Mike Gibson, who's a cardiologist at the um, BI. It compares all the trials. So ADOPT was the first trial. You look at VTE events, look at bleeding events. So there was no difference when compared with uh, um, uh, Lovenox in terms of prevention of thrombosis. Big difference is take a pill as opposed to take a shot. How, what percentage of our patients on the hospitalist service refuse their shots or any service? Very high. They're not getting compliance. Okay, they're not going to go home and very few are going to give themselves, continue to give themselves shots. But there was more, a little bit more bleeding on apixaban. In the Magellan trial, which is rivaroxaban, it was clearly Rivi was better than anoxaparin for preventing VET events, strongly more higher risk of bleeding. In the Mariner trial, which was just published in July, uh, they had an overall lower incidence. It's claimed that these patients were less ill. Um, uh, but they were equivalent, and they're also equivalent in bleeding. This is a, you could argue it's a negative trial, but it's really not a negative trial. It's really a trial um, um, that shows that the rivaroxaban is just as good as uh, uh, enoxaparin. What would you want to give your mother, okay? And, uh, and the APEX trial, which is the patrixaban, this is the overall data, was better, and the bleeding was the same. So this is a comparison between Apex and Mariner. Patrixaban has a longer half-life, a lower peak. I think the rivaroxaban peak, rivaroxaban, it should be a twice-a-day drug, but Bayer took the risk of doing the clinical trials and giving a higher dose at once a day. But you get a higher peak, and if you have a site to bleed, maybe it bleeds more. There's no data on that, but that's, that's my gestalt, whatever that's worth. Um, um, Patrixaban is not renally cleared, longer half-life. People, you know, in the inpatient service, you really freak about a long half-life. Fonda Paranox as an outpatient drug for patients with cancer and thrombosis has been a godsend in my, in my practice. Very stable levels, 
very uh, stable uh, levels that we measure in plasma, we measure those levels, relatively low incidence of bleeding. In fact, it's been the anticoagulant to take care of all the anticoagulation problems um, that are referred to me that somebody needs a good anticoagulant. Don't be afraid of a long half-life. And we have an antidote, albeit off-label. Um, the APEX trial is very important. It was started during admission. Mariner started the drug at discharge. So the modus operandi of our medical practice is you do something in the hospital, the patient is then, all of a sudden somebody says, oh, you've got to get the patient out. You do something very quick, you either give them six days of Lovenox or a prescription to fill for Lovenox. They have no idea what the cost is going to be. They go to the pharmacy, needs a prior approval, they get sticker shock, they go for a few days. They end up in my office with no anticoagulant. My nurse has to spend 40% of her time doing the prior approvals that could have been done in the hospital. Our hospital has no means to do inpatient prior approvals if you want to start a drug, an oral drug, in the hospital to be continued as an outpatient. That's a negative aspect for medical care, the bad handoff. Um, but, but it's not unique to us. It's actually a national problem, um, 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 and, uh, and everybody does it that way. So it's important, perhaps, to start it during the hospitalization. Um, these are other ancillary things. It looks like uh, other issues were reduced by the longer anticoagulation. Surgery data shows that post-op, longer anticoagulation actually reduces the risk of coming back with recurrent VTE, um, which is peaks usually 18 to 20 days post-op. Okay, in the last minute um, is DOAX and cancer. So this is really hot information, and I'll explain this. Um, um, first of all, um, everybody uses enoxaparin. There's not really good data in enoxaparin. It's just in the recommendations. The best data is with semiparin and daltiparin, which are two drugs that are not available to us. Okay? All right. Um, but Rivaroxaban was in the Select D trial, which presented at ASH last year and published in, J in JCO in July, compared rivaroxaban and daltiparin. Small numbers of patients. VTE rate at six months was 4% in RIVI, 11% in DALTI. Hazard ratio of 0.4 favors RIVI. The bleeding rate at six months was <clears throat> um, a little higher in, um, in, in, with rivaroxaban than in daltiparin. Second trial, edoxaban, not generally available, um, uh, uh, not on formulary to my knowledge. Is it on formulary? It is on formulary. Stand corrected. The overall event rates of edoxaban uh, versus daltiparin were the same. Now, what this means, the overall VTE recurrence and bleeding, those are the overall event rates that are being measured. When you break it down to um, a VTE, sorry about the typo, it was 7% in edoxaban, 3%, 11% in DALT. A hazard ratio favors edoxaban, not quite significant. But the bleeding rate with edoxaban was a little bit higher than, than with daltiparin. Hazard rate uh, um, a ratio favors uh, uh, daltiparin. Thrombosis prevention in cancer patients. Um, so. We all know that cancer has high risk for malignancy. Pancreatic cancer is the archetype example. Lung cancer, lymphoma are also examples. I mean, obviously, if somebody has a fungating um, um, colon cancer, you're, you're not going to put them on VTE prophylaxis or a fungating a gastric cancer or a glioblastoma in their brain. Um, but many other cancers, you could put them on anticoagulant prophylaxis because they're high risk. So the, those data now are starting to come out. So there's two trials. This trial was published last Saturday. We can go Saturday in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's not even have a citation yet. Early study, it's a Pixaban, twice a day versus placebo. These are placebo-run trials. And what they found was the VTE rate at six months in PROFI for a pixaban was lower than placebo. Hazard ratio favors it strongly significant. Obviously, the bleeding rate is higher with a pixaban than placebo, um, um, strongly favors placebo. 
Well, what would you want to do to prevent your clot? And likewise, uh, the rivaroxaban trial was presented by uh, our colleague uh, five blocks away, Alok Karana, in uh, late-breaking abstracts at ASH last Monday, a week ago Monday, a Cassini trial, an international trial, 841 patients. The VTE rate was, with rivaroxaban, 10 milligrams a day was under 3% versus placebo hazard ratio, favors it uh, highly significant. The bleeding rate, of course, was a little bit higher, um, uh, but, but it turned out it was not significant than placebo. Now, those are not in oncology guidelines, and, um, and, um, but, they're, but they're working on them, and they will be new guidelines that for certain kinds of cancers that prophylaxis with these oral DOACs is appropriate to decrease the VTE risk. There was a suggestion, uh, but the data is still not clear whether it overall improves survival, um, which has been a – the medical oncology community doesn't think a lot about VTE because overall they're focused on treating the cancer um, and, um, and the risks are relatively low. But for those who have anticoagulation, um, those who have thrombosis, it adds a lot to the decreased – quality of life and their morbidity. Hence, if we can provide, prevent thrombosis, then I think we get, will continue to help these patients in their care. So I'm 40 seconds over time. Thank you. That was fantastic. I mean, it's so important. And you, you volunteered to give this grand round for John. I'm really grateful. It's such an important topic. and. Uh, and we have a couple minutes for questions. I do want to announce that this is the last Grand Rounds of this calendar year. The next Grand Rounds is January 8th. There's no Grand Rounds next week. Um, I'll be here January 1st at noon in case anybody's here. I'll, I'll be beginning with talking. January 8th is the next Grand Rounds. So, um, so we, I think we still use Warfarin because it's, it's the out-of-pocket cost. I know it's expensive, but the out-of-pocket cost of the patient is less. It seems like that's suboptimal. Big picture? Is that I think so. Um, yeah, no, I understand the out-of-pocket costs are, but the cost in patients' time, the cost in morbidity, um, the cost in a healthcare system for people to draw the blood, people to record the blood, pre calls back and forth, is inordinately expensive. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I sort of. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in the camp of Tom Zenti. I like organizations like CVS taking over healthcare, total management of healthcare costs as opposed to farm companies or uh, this and that. Because again, it, it, you know, we have to look at the, the best therapies in the long run usually decrease the overall cost and improve the quality of life of a patient. And, and so, so I think it behooves us to, um, to try to function in those directions. Unfortunately, we have um, a small percentage, but real, of patients with no insurance, with nothing. And the out of cost, uh, um, of, uh, out of pocket expenses are just inordinate to them and uh, um, to, to cover the cost of these things. <clears throat> I mean, we, we all dream about a day with no cooling clinic. <clears throat> Other questions or, or comments? Please. Are you No, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. <clears throat> yeah, so in our patients with end-stage renal disease or very low GFR, what do we do? Well, so, so it, it – well, there's a colleague in my division who we always fight about this. And so you have the evidence-based medicine guys, right? You're all supposed to be. That was drilled into your head. And then you have the old guys like me. So the approval for apixaban was they studied patients with stages one through three and patients on dialysis, and, and it was shown to be safe and effective. So the, the label includes patients on dialysis at a reduced dose, 2.5 every 12 hours. Now, the problem is the stages three and four. That was not in the approval. So we have a hospital a few blocks away that won't give that to a patient who has stages three and four because it wasn't in the original FDA label. 
Now, there are newer data. There was a paper, I think it's published in circulation because I'd seen a preprint of a, of a mere 23,000 patients of retrospective PCORI data, which looked at stages four and five patients with renal disease, and which appeared to be safe or, or, or so forth. So the old guys like me will bite the bullet and try to do what I, we think could be wrong, of course, but anything we do, we could be wrong, um, um, that I would do this for the patient's benefit as opposed to put them on warfarin. Um, some of you may object um, with evidence and wouldn't do that. So that's, that's personal, personal choice. <clears throat> Hard to argue against. Because of the late hour, I, I think uh, we won't take more questions. Again, that was really fantastic. Very grateful. Thank you so much.